Awesome, awesome. Love Kwan. We used to call him our most eligible bachelor, but he is taken. And uh, so any other guys want to step up? I mean, here we go. Uh, you let me know. He gave us permission, so we never outed anybody. Uh, but it's, it's so great to be with you. If you're new with us, maybe you're going, what is this church about? They like to clap a lot. Um, my name is Chris Pate. I'm the lead pastor here and just thankful to be able to minister with you, uh, to you today and get in the word of God together. Before we get in scripture, and we've had a lot going on, but before we dive into continue our series on abide, uh, I wanna mention, he made reference, uh, Quan made reference to our fast. We had a great fast. How many of you guys got to join us either online or a few? of the days. I mean, this is our sixth service this week. So our staff's a little tired, uh, but we are energized by the Lord because the spirit is willing, even if the flesh is weak. And so it's been such a great week. This every year, this week is so great. And our fast isn't just us and our church here in Houston, but we get to celebrate with our Ever Nation Global Family, which is the network we are a part of that has 80 countries represented. And so we got to pray fast together all in one accord and believe God for what he wants to do for 2022. I hope you are filled up. Those of you online with at least half of our churches online right now and has been, we hope you are filled up. We hope you are blessed and ready to go. It's been such a great time. Friday night was the culmination of our fast and the ending. And I got to share some vision about where God is going. If you wanna know about that, go to our YouTube. Uh, subscribe, hit smash that like button. Just kidding. But do, do the thing you need to do. You can watch it so you can get more information about where we're going and kind of what we're up to as a church where we are very excited about the vision that God has called us to as a people to bless the generation and not just be about ourselves. Let me just show you real quick. I'm not gonna go into all of it, but we're about to go into a building phase to build first on the left side, this building, the smaller building to build that out, which is this building right over here adjacent to us that we were able to purchase in 2020, the end of 2020. And we've been talking about and praying, what are we going to do with it? We're partnering with a daycare in order to be able to use it throughout the week. It's not sitting there until Sunday. It will be used to bless and reach the community and help have affordable care for families that need that in this time. And we're super excited about partnering with a company in order to be able to do that. And again, isn't it great to have buildings that will be used constantly? And then on Sundays, we're able to use that for our children's church and expand and explode our children's church as we believe uh, God has continued to bless us. And so we're very excited about that. We'll be doing in phases and you're gonna hear more about that in March. So the next thing with this new vision and where we're going and some of the things happening, we are rebranding, uh, not just Steph Curry and Subway is refreshing. We're refreshing some things, our logo and, 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 and some of our vision with where God has taken us. We have the same mission values, who we are. That never changes, but sometimes the method changes. And for us, we are instituting a new rebranding of city life. This is picture of roads and specifically the downtown area that really constitutes Houston, the iconic downtown area. And the reason why we're doing this to refresh, but also we want to remind Constantly, Every time you see this logo and this icon that we're gonna slowly start putting everywhere, we want you to be reminded that it's our job to go to every highway and byway and to immerse and traverse the city to make disciples, to go out, not just to be gathered here, but to be sent to watch Houston change one person at a time, beginning with the next generation, beginning with campus ministry, beginning with where you are in your location, your vocation, your tribulation, and your recreation. We are passionate about this and we wanna help that constantly be about our vision and city life. Can I get an amen besides my wife? Okay. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know my wife's voice, that's for sure. Um, and I appreciate it. I've known her since she was a cheerleader in ninth grade and she's always been a great cheerleader, but so much more. Oh, look at that. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. I remember playing football and seeing the cheerleader on the side. I'm like, did you see that tackle? I remember that. I'm like, oh yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to be doing a marriage class on Wednesday nights coming up in February. So there's a plug. 
Hey, let's dive in. We're gonna be in the book of John. You can get it ready, but we're not gonna dive quite yet. But today we're still in Abide series. We're doing a five-week series. This is part two. And we're talking about abiding. What does it mean to abide? It means to remain. It means to make your home within. It means to settle in, stay in. And abide. And God has made his abode, his home. He came here. He didn't say, come to me, climb this mountain, traverse it, do what you have to do, be this good. You have to be this tall to be like me and to do what I do and to get into my heaven. He said, I'm going to come to you. That's the God we serve. He traversed and came to us and he changed the whole world through his only begotten son, Jesus, who we worship. And, and that Word that Jesus, John told us last week, we started with this, became flesh. He became incarnate, in meat, incarnate. God became flesh and dwelt among us. We studied and we saw. He abided with us. And so he could then abide in us and through us. So God does the abiding, but then it's our job also to abide in him, to trust in him. And we can trust in him because the word Jesus gives life. We're going to talk about Jesus giving life through his words. I was reading an article recently, and it stumbled upon this interesting article and this interesting man that I found in this article. You can see the quote of this man named Lal Bahari. He's from India, and here's his quote. If you actually kill someone, you become a criminal. If you kill someone on paper, there is no body and no crime. And you're going, what? Let me give you context for this. As we're talking about how Jesus gives life, how the word gives life, Life. I stumbled upon this article about an association, a community, a group. You know, you could find a group for anything, but this is a legit association called the Association of Dead People, started by Lal Bahari. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's interesting. Here's the thing, though. The Association of Des Dead People isn't quite what you think. At first, I was like, what is this? Because being alive is actually a requirement to being a part of it. But what had happened is Lal Bihar, in, that, in the mid-1970s, discovered he was dead on paper. At age 21 in India, he applied for a loan to start a business. The bank wanted proof of identity and other documentation. So he went back to his father's village to get it. That's when he heard the news of his own death. True story. Now, Lal didn't want any property at this point. Now he wasn't interested in a business. He was now trying to figure out what has happened so he can get on with life. Can you imagine if you lost all of your identity and was proclaimed dead? You would, how would you substantiate who you are? He pleaded with every possible official to rectify the error only in vain. He also tried to do everything he can to get the documents so that he could say, hey, I'm alive. And this is interesting. This is what he said. It became my life's mission to not be dead. And literally his life's mission. So what had happened is he discovered in order to inherit his share of the family's ancestral homeland in India, a relative of Bihar's had him declared deceased. You think you have a dysfunctional family. How was your Christmas? Man, it was so hard. Did your family declare you dead so they could take your land? No, okay, you're okay. Um, maybe something can happen. It said this, it took him a staggering 17 years to undo what his relative has done. Can you imagine? Frustrated with the extremely slow process to get himself declared alive, he formed an advocacy group called the Association of Dead People in order to help go through the same thing without having to go through everything he went through. I thought in this idea of the word and Jesus gives life, how crazy it is it? This man's quote, his mission was not to be dead. 
The thing that we're about to read in scripture, Jesus' words, what he says about giving life and even giving eternal life, is throughout the scripture. We see, even from the very beginning, the first two pages of your Bible, a God who creates the world, has everything beautiful, good, creates man and woman, and is walking with them and loving them. And it's a beautiful picture of what we call ultimately heaven, paradise, where we want to go to. But men and women went their own way. And the Bible says death then entered into the equation because of man and woman going their own way and saying, I don't want what God wants. I want what I want. And we are now continuing to battle this battle. And I thought it was apropos that many of us, our life's ambition is just to not be dead instead of to really receive full life. What do you mean, Chris? Well, when Jesus comes and proclaims things like, I am the way, I'm the path, I am the truth, I am life. When he proclaims to have it, to give it, he's proclaiming some pretty powerful things here. He's proclaiming, really, that everyone is in essence dead. Paul would later in Romans say this, that our sin has actually brought death in and it causes the fruit of it, causes death. Death, when I sin, when I go about it the wrong way, will be death in my relationships, death in my income, death in my strategy, death ultimately when we try to do things ourselves because we were created to be with God and to get our life from God, to get our orders and instructions from a good God, not here to harm us, but a good father. And as we grow up and we have bad parents and bad fathers and bad experiences, we go, well, I'm just going to try it my way. And let me tell you, everyone has tried that and faltered and Jesus comes to the earth and says, what you're looking for, I have. All you're getting and all you're trying to pursue in all of your getting in more income, once I get more income, then I'll be happy. Once I get a spouse, then I'll be happy. Once I get a house, then I'll be happy. Once I have this, then I'll be happy. Once my kids are grown up, then I'll be happy. Once I go to college, then I'll be happy. Once I finish my graduate program, then I'll be happy. We're trying to get life, and it's funny. Every time we get it and we eject it in us, it's never enough. It only causes more death because we're called to get our life through Jesus. And that life starts Not when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. This is my Baptist church when I grew up. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Some of you guys know this. We just think about when I get to heaven, but what about right now? Because Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is now, and we're going now. I want to see life now. And we go, well, maybe I need this article and this thing. Maybe I need this next thing. Maybe I need to wake up early in the morning. Then I'll feel more life and do all those things. That's not bad, but first, 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 come to the source of life. Now, I'm preaching before we get in the word. Here we go. What does Jesus say? Before we dive into John chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 16 through 29. I want to give you a little context of what's happening. Jesus is going around. He will heal, and then he'll teach. He'll heal, and then he'll teach. He'll do a work, and then he'll teach. And he's confirming who he is through his powers, through his authority. And right before we're about to get to what we're reading, Jesus has just healed a man on the Sabbath who was lame for 38 years. You think you've had a bad two years, like me. Yeah, it's been rough. 38 years, people are carrying you, taking you, feeding you, helping you. A lot of us know people that have been in trouble, that have been sick, that have been hurting for years and years and years. This is that man, and Jesus comes to him in this place called the Pools of Bethesda, which if you ever go to Israel with us, which we used to do once a year, and once they open back, we'll, we'll go back, because you can actually see that and see where Jesus was. It's amazing. He goes right outside the temple and he sees this man and he has a conversation with him, ultimately heals him. But here's the deal. The religious Jews get mad at him because it was the Sabbath. Ooh, dun, dun, dun. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Instead of rejoicing in the life, they are focusing and actually choking out life with their religiosity. And this is where we dive into verse 16. And this was why 
the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Now, we're reading this quick. These are profound words. He's making himself equal with God. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, praise the Lord, but he passes from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Verse 27, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now, we don't have time to go through every, there's so much in here, but here's what we're going to focus on today and I'm going to give it to you in a statement. Jesus is the only one with the ability, authority, and avidity to give you life and life eternal. Now, I lost a lot of you at avidity. You said, did he make that word up? He did not, but he is a preacher and we have to rhyme. So here, here's what happens. Ability, Jesus is the only one with the power, the only one raising people from the dead, healing people, walking on water, with, by the way, eyewitnesses, okay? Eyewitnesses. We don't just believe things blindly. Eyewitnesses telling us, which is how, honestly, you believe anything, by the way. Anything you've ever studied in history is based on the testimony of two or three people. This is why we believe this. But he is the only one with the ability, which is the power in and of himself. He has power to be able to say, be still in the wind and the waves, obey him. We see this power and ability. They saw it with him healing a man that was lame for 38 years. Not only that, though, he's the only one with that level of authority. Authority is not just the power within, but the power given to you from someone else, a higher entity, which we'll get into. And lastly, the word avidity, you should use it 10 times this week, just so you have it. It is the eagerness or the enthusiasm or the dedication to do it. He's the only one. He's the only one that's actually followed through with eagerness to help us. And we're gonna get to that today. Let's look at, well, how does the scripture say he has the only one with the ability to give life and life eternal? Verse 16, his ability is power. In verse 16, it says, as we read, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. First law, first of all, Side note, if you're working for God and doing God's thing, expect persecution from people. 
Paul says, persecuted for righteousness, you should rejoice. Now, if you're persecuted because you're being stupid, stop being stupid. (laughs) That's your fault. But expect, not everybody's going to love you when you love God. Not everybody's going to love you when you do the work. Can you imagine? People wanted to kill this man who's healing a guy that was lame 38 years. If we had Twitter, they would be blasted, man. If we had pictures, it would be all over. We know the end of the story, what actually happened. And it says this, but Jesus answered them. This is, this is amazing. They're mad. How dare you do this? Jesus says, like father, like son. I see my father working. And I love this idea. He's working until now. Do you know right, you know right now God is working right now? Right now. He hears your prayers. He hears your prayer and fasting. He's working. And when you trust him and rest in him and say, I'm done, I can't do it. He says, finally, let me go. Quit worrying and anxious about everything. How is it growing you? How are you growing even in your stature because you worry about everything in the future? Trust me, because I'm working. Aren't you glad you serve a God that's working? He's moving. If you don't believe that, that is the very crux and root of hopelessness. I'm alone. Nobody's helping me. I can't do it. And I've tried and I've failed. I'm without hope. And Jesus says, all I did is see God move and I joined him. And they recognized this was a claim of divinity because he said, that's my father. We use that language a lot. They didn't use that language as much. They would say things like, we are children of Abraham. And Jesus would say, Father, God. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. You have to understand, Jesus proclaims very, very clearly that he's God. People often get mad, but Jesus is a really good teacher. He's a great philosopher. He's a great prophet. But listen, there's no such thing as a great teacher that would proclaim the things that Jesus proclaimed about himself. No great prophet or great teacher proclaimed to be very clearly God to the point that's what got him killed. You understand? And so you cannot say, I really like, I don't like religion or church or these things. I just, I love Jesus and I'm all about Jesus. I'm not really into the Bible, but I love Jesus. Listen, I don't love the Bible because it tells me about Jesus. I trust in Jesus and he loves the Bible. So I better because he is the one telling me what to do. He is the one crafting my desires as I submit to him and look to him as you are more powerful. And even in our prayer and fasting, you got to know that. You are a powerful God. You are able. You are able. You are able. That's why we continue in prayer and trust. We see his ability, and he's the only one that could do it while many have tried. And he not only proclaimed it, but he demonstrated it. And this is the beautiful thing. Now, what about the authority? The only one with authority. Let's look, verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, stop. When you read this in the Bible, truly, truly, this is so important. This is like if they had the ability to like highlight, underline, help you understand, have an emoji to be like, listen, you need to do that. Let's cue in on this. In John, there's 25 times Jesus says truly, truly. So if you're reading, you need to look. And what it is, the actual word is amen, amen, which means this. I and the one giving the authority. This isn't the authority of someone else. This is my authority. And take it as my word. I am authoritative. This is it. I'm in, I'm in. So be it. So be it. This is, this is agreement. I don't need your opinion. This is truth. And we're all looking for truth these days, aren't we? With all the things, I don't know what's true anymore. I don't know what to believe anymore. Jesus says, here, my words, truly, truly. This is very, very powerful. And this speaks of his authority, which is why they were so upset with him as well. He says this, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son, shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Listen, 
when anybody goes on a military mission or army mission, you know, they don't do anything just on their own. They're waiting for orders. And this is what he says. Listen, the, the God you say you serve, he's the one giving me the orders. And if I was wrong, he's, he, later he says, just look at my works. It does it actually happen. And the answer is yes. It substantiates him. It's always the higher officers that give orders to, in order to submit. And this tells us that Jesus came on a mission for us. He came on a mission to just do father like son, like father like son. Yesterday, I've had I, I, me and my wife and my family, COVID went through us in December and we're all better now. We're all good, super immune, let's go. And yesterday was the first time back to, I have a garage gym that G talked me into and it's so worth it. And so it's called Paint Gym and it was open yesterday for the first time. It's been closed due to um, uh, COVID and restriction and lack of employees, but now it is open again and I'm super excited. So I was getting in there lifting and I told my youngest son, Jackson, Paint Gym's open. He said, I want to come. So I brought him in and he just imitated me like father, like son. What I showed him now, I didn't make him do a lot of stuff. He's 10, but follow me, do this. And he just, he, and he wants to do what daddy does. Jesus says, I just want to do what my father does. You know, he came here for us, yes, but he came here because of the love of God, the Trinity, the mutual triune love they have for one another. It's a beautiful thing. And he says, this is where I get my authority. And the scripture says he laid that authority when he came to earth. His Godhead, he laid that down to show us how to submit to the Father ultimately. It's a beautiful representation, his authority. Look, it continues to say about his authority in 21. For the Father raises the dead and, I love this, gives them life. This is not just talking about resurrection miracles. It's talking about everybody who's walking around trying to live their life just to prove they're not dead and find some kind of life. He says the father's the one who gives life. So also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. This is a bold statement. You don't honor me, which means to take me heavily, not lightly, not dismissing me, not casually, but make me as equal with God, then God won't accept you. This is bold teaching. His authority is evident. I know in my life when I started trusting in the authority of him and his word, as I was dragged to church as a kid, my parents divorced when I was 12. My mom remarried a youth pastor. And so now I was forced to go to church where we didn't go that often. We were kind of the CEO Christians, right? The Christian, uh, Christmas and Easter only Christians. And so for us, we just went every once in a while to church and community. We didn't really dive into community. We just, you know, kind of give me my thing and I'm going to move on. And so I remember arguing with my parents as a teenager. I don't want to go to church. I'm so tired. I don't want to go to church. But I, I'm telling you, even before I fully gave my life to Christ, there was something about the message. There was something about the atmosphere that changes because God enters the room. And I knew there's life there because I would almost, even as a teacher, almost every time after service say, thank you for making me do that. I needed that. And it wasn't until I was 17 until I truly got to the end of myself and the end of the things that I had been searching for and some of the idols that I had had in my heart that I finally trusted in God's power, his ability, and his authority in my life to say, you are Lord, not me, not this, not that. You and honoring the son, Jesus says, is honoring the father. This is salvation, placing your trust in God. Finally, Jesus is the only one, not only with the ability, with the authority, but also with the avidity. And in 27, verse 27, it says this, and he, God, has given him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment because he is the son of, we're thinking he's gonna say God, but he says, man, do not marvel at this. And he's saying to these Jewish religious leaders, don't marvel at this. You know why? Because this has been what the whole story has been about. And you missed it in the Old Testament, in the covenant. You missed it. Don't, mar- don't be amazed because just like he said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, how do you not know these things? This is not a new teaching. This is scripture. 
For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Praise the Lord. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I want to hone in on this phrase, he, this identity, this name tag. He gives himself son of man. And instead of giving a soliloquy of what this is, some of my favorite teaching is through the Bible Project. I want to show you one of their first videos. You could tell because the art has gotten so much better. If you don't know what Bible Project is, check it out. Download the app. It's fire. And check out this video called Son of Man to see what is Son of Man and what's the significance of showing his eagerness, his authority, and his ability. Check this out. If you read the New Testament, you'll notice that the most common title people use to describe Jesus is the Christ, that is, the Messiah. But surprisingly, Jesus almost never used that word to describe himself. Instead, he called himself the Son of Man. The Son of Man, what does that mean? Well, the phrase comes from an important chapter in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel was an Israelite prisoner of war who was forced to live in the empire of Babylon and work for the prideful, violent king who destroyed his home. That sounds horrible. And while he was living and working in Babylon, Daniel had this crazy prophetic dream. You ready for it? I'm ready. He saw four beasts crawling out of a dark sea, hybrid monster-like animals, each scarier than the one before. And the fourth beast is so mutant, there's nothing to compare it to. And it's violent, leaving death and destruction in its wake. What in the world is this about? Well, he's told that these beasts symbolize violent, prideful kings and their empires. Oh, like the one Daniel's enslaved to. Yeah, and these creatures might seem random to you, but these images are developing an important biblical theme. How humans are these remarkable creatures capable of doing great good and horrible evil. How we can behave like animals. Right. Look at the first pages of the Bible. God creates the beasts of the field and humans together, all from the dust. But then the humans are set apart and given a royal task of being God's image. So humans are like the animals, but called to become much more. Yeah, they're to be God's representatives on earth, ruling on his behalf like kings and queens. But keep reading, and the humans are deceived by a beast who says that they could be more than just God's partners. Yeah, that they could rule the world on their own terms, which sounds good to them. But God knows this will be a disaster. And so he expels the humans to the realm of the beasts. The partnership is lost. But God makes a promise that one day a human will be born who won't give in to the beast. Rather, he'll overcome and strike the beast while being struck by it. Okay, so for the rest of the biblical story, we're waiting for that human. But instead, in story after story, we find people acting like beasts. Yeah, like in the next story about Cain, who's jealous and angry at his brother Abel. God warns Cain that he's facing a beastly urge called sin, a dark, mysterious kind of evil that consumes humans. But God says that Cain can rule the beast if he chooses. But he doesn't rule the beast. He lets this urge devour him, and he becomes a beast. And then after this, Cain's children spread their animal-like violence, and it leads to the founding of a whole civilization known for its beastly pride, the city of Babylon. Okay, Babylon. So fast forward, this is where Daniel is enslaved, having this bizarro dream. Exactly. Now, watch what happens next in Daniel's dream. He sees into God's throne room where a court is set up, and God condemns the beast to destruction. That's great. And then Daniel sees that there's actually more than one divine throne. Oh, right, the throne that humanity left behind. Right. There hasn't been a human who's able to overcome the beast and rule alongside God until now. Daniel sees a figure called the Son of Man, which means a human. And he rides on a cloud up into God's presence and then sits down on the divine throne to rule the world. The partnership's renewed. Yes, and even more, all humanity worships and serves this Son of Man alongside God. Oh, huh, worship? So this is no ordinary human. This is like a God human. Exactly. And so now you can see why Jesus of Nazareth, when he came onto the scene centuries later, chose this title, the Son of Man, for himself. He was claiming to be that truly human one on a mission to confront the beast. He was tempted to seize power on the beast's terms. But unlike every human before him, Jesus resisted the urge. 
And then he went about banishing the beast from people's lives, and he was teaching people how to rule the beast instead of being ruled by it. Okay, so how do you rule the beast? Well, Jesus did it by giving up his life. Wait, rule the beast by dying? Yes. When Jesus was on trial in a human courtroom and being condemned to death, he said, From this moment on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at God's right hand and coming on the clouds. But this is the moment he's about to die. Exactly. From one perspective, the cross looks like a beastly torture device. But Jesus viewed it as his throne. And on this throne, he exposed the subhuman nature of our evil by letting it do its worst. And then he overcame it with his divine life and love. Jesus' execution was his exaltation. So Jesus is the first human to overcome the beast. And as a result, he can partner with God to rule the world. And so now Jesus is summoning a new humanity into existence, one that can overcome the beast in the same paradoxical way. To rule the beast by dying. And then by discovering that Jesus' life and power can become our life and power. So we can rule the world as God's partners, but Jesus style, in the power of service, humility, and self-giving love. Powerful. I've seen it a million times and I'm still struck, especially as Jesus says to these religious leaders, this has been God's plan all along. But God himself had to come. And we now have the responsibility and will be judged based on whether we put our trust in the ability, the authority, and the avidity of Jesus to give us life and life eternal, or if we're gonna say, no, I got this. So many of us, we could go around the room and give our testimony of how we came to Christ. And a lot of it, we had to get to the bottom, didn't we? We had to get to the bottom where I've tried a little bit of everything. I had New Year's resolution. I had resolution. I had revolution. I was awakened and woke to this and that. And yet at the end, as I continued to try, and because it was just an ideology of man, which was made from the dust of the earth, that Jesus says, if you build your life on the dust, on sand, when the storms come, it crumbles. That's the testimony of everything. And yet... Jesus, the name of Jesus, the church of Jesus has prevailed for 2,000 years. Why? Even though it's had its ups and downs because it got distracted by the beast and consumed by the beast and stopped going to God for life, which is always the temptation and the need for repentance, even within the church. At the end of the day, Jesus is looking for a bride that is without spot or wrinkled people that will say, you know what? I'm done with it all. I'm done with it, and I trust you, your power, your might, your authority, and your eagerness and willingness to do what no one else could do. I don't know about you, that's the God I want to serve. That's the God I want to serve people with and live life with and have the same avidity and eagerness to take as my Savior did to the world, the message of the gospel. As we move into a time of communion, it's always a great time for us and really our altar moment before we worship to be able to look at the broken body of Jesus and the cup of his blood. This institution that he gave his disciples as he was declaring to be the son of man that will come and destroy the beast, but not in the fashion we thought. He said these words this is my body. This represents my body. And as you take and eat it, I want you to remember me. And what we remember about Jesus is he was broken for us. Many of us today find ourselves in broken relationship, broken trials, broken problems, maybe broken bodies, and it's frustrating. But let me, let me tell you, we serve a God that chose to be broken, not just happened to be broken like us. He chose to be broken, and it's that kind of God that would make that choice because he says, I know you're broken. I'm going to become like you so that you can be fully like me with the life of God easing out. And it's that broken grapes that creates the wine, something new and fresh in you. And this is what represents who we are and remind us who we are in Christ. Every time we take and eat, 
the body of Christ. Do this and remember of him. Take and eat the bread. And we take, the second thing he said is the cup, and this is the blood of the covenant. Just like we have our family history, and you go to the doctor, and you say, yeah, my family has diabetes or has this in it, and we have to tell them because that bloodline runs through us, and we could maybe potentially have that same type of thing. Jesus says, I'm not just giving you my physical body, but I want the very inside of you changed as well. So I have poured out my blood, a new life, and now you can be sons and daughters of God with the blood line and power running, coursing through your veins when you believe and put your trust in Jesus. He said, take the cup and remember me, take the cup. I wanna pray and we're gonna close in one moment and come up and have some next steps. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, will you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are good, God, that you are powerful, that you are able to move Lord, we worship you in this place because you deserve it. If you're here, your head is bowed, your eyes are closed, and you've never put your trust in God ultimately. You've never seen the relationship that he offers with his own self and taking that and honored that to the point of saying, I trust you more than anything. That's what we call belief. That's what we call salvation, putting your hope and trust in him. If you've never done that, we want to invite you to do that today. And the way we do it here is we have this book called One to One Book right after service. We want you to go. We'll have one available. And we want to give you a starting tool to help you not just make a private confirmation of your faith, but also to start learning and in public. Let us know so we can help you walk in community and walk this life out as we have to learn how to tame the beast by trusting in the Lord. Father, we thank you and we bless you. I pray that you stir our hearts as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand to your feet as we worship the Lord together?